Welcome to the Brigham Young University Family History Library webinar series. Feel free to use the chat box for any questions during the presentation, and if we're unable to answer them during the presentation, we'll make sure we get to them by the end. There is a handout for today's webinar that can be downloaded from the files pod. Um, if you click on the file, they'll be able, you'll be able to download it from there, and you'll be able to look back and reference for later. Today, you'll be pleased to hear from Marilyn Thompson, who will be giving a presentation titled Using Daughters of the American Revolution Research to Strengthen and Extend Your Pedigree. Marilyn graduated in 2005 from BYU with a bachelor's degree in family history. She interned in at the National Archive in Georgia and later served for three years at the Family History Library in Salt Lake. She has also served as a Family History Center director for three years in Orem, Utah. Um, so we'll turn the time over to Marilyn now, and then she'll be able to um, give us a presentation today. Well, hello. I am so excited to be here. I usually start my class out by asking the class members, you know, why why did you decide to take this class? And and for this class, sometimes they'll say. Oh, I um, have an aunt who is a member of the Daughters of the American Revolution, and so I want to know all about it. And, and other time there'll be men in my class, and they'll say, "Wow, I I found a Daughter of American Revolution um, sticker on a, a headstone, and that that opened up all of my research." And and so various people have reasons for attending this class, but I thought I'd start out by telling you why I wanted to teach this class. Um, I um, 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 got my degree at BYU, and I had a professor who is not moving down. Uh, let's see. OK, the next screen. OK. When I, um, there we go. OK. There, I had a professor who said we needed to learn how to use the Daughters of the American Revolution. And so I went and I found this lineage book. And I'm looking at that. And I'm saying, oh, this is good. And then I saw this page. And I went, oh, my goodness. I have no clue what that's about or how I'm supposed to use that for genealogical research. I, I am clueless. And so that's the, the purpose that I have with doing this is to, to try and, and help other clueless people to be able to understand what the Daughters of the American Revolution is and um, how to use uh, the resources that they have provided us. Um, we're going to start out by looking at some pedigrees. We'll look at the history of the Daughters of the American Revolution. And um, then we'll go to their web page. And we'll look at the web page and look at how to use um, the databases that they have. And so I hope that this will make you a, a, a better researcher as, as a result, and that you too will be able to open up some of those brick walls. So we're going to start out by um, um, talking about what is the, the Daughters of the American Revolution. Um, the, back in 1876, um, the, the, the country had been 100 years old, and they had a great big celebration. And, and all of these organizations started to be created um, um, the, by these patriots. Of the, um, and they, they got together, and there was the Sons of the American Revolution. And um, the Daughters of the American Revolution were so excited. But in 1890, their Sons of the American Revolution said, um, no daughters can belong to the Sons of the American Revolution. Well, these women said, what, what? Um, there were women that were as great a patriots as the Sons. And so there was a letter written by a Revolutionary War widow, Mary Smith Lockhart. And um, there's a photo here of her. And, um, she told a beautiful story of a, a woman who spoke up to her, her husband and rallied the men to support the revolution. And, and she said, don't these women deserve recognition for their patriotism as well? And, and um, so as a result of that, the sons encouraged the women to develop the Daughters of the American Revolution. And they met at this um, 
uh, Mary Lockhart's home was where they first started. So if you pause and you think about that, that these f women who, f who came and in masses and joined the, this organization were um, daughters and granddaughters of these Revolutionary War patriots, it helps you to understand how the records and the preservation of these lineages and these stories and um, how they preserve buildings and that how important the daughters have been to the history of the United States. Um, let's see. So there were four women who um, who really were the founders, and and kind of their saying was, were there no mothers of the revolution? And so you think of mothers and apple pie and the revolution, and and so that's what this is all about. So um, these daughters came together, and um, they started to um, create books, they gathered histories, they um, started putting in their application, then there became a need to be able to look at these applications and look for ones who were valid or not. And so um, they said, who can join? And they decided that it has to be women that are 18 years or older and the ones that can um, provide um, blood lineage. And you say, well, can you come into this by adoption? But um, it, it does, you can only do it through your bloodlines. Um, you have to be able to, to prove those lines to be able to join. Um, they, have, they started to provide this documentation to prove the lineage and they needed to have a building to be able to house all of this and so they created the library. Um, and, if you were to want to join the Daughters of the American Revolution, um, if you go on to um, their website, the DAR, um, um, then you would be able to um, it'll say in here, are you interested? And there's a membership interest form right here. And you fill that out, and they will forward it to um, a, a, a group of daughters that is close to you. And the advantage of that is that these char chapters have registrars that would be able to help you to gather the documents and to fill out the form and make recommendations. And, and so it's kind of like having a coach or a mentor or somebody who, who is able to help you to work through this. Um, it's a wonderful way to strengthen your pedigree, to make new friends, and, and just to find out all of the many ways of serving your community. Um, with wonderful people. Um, they will, um, you can also go on to that website and you can look for a local chapter um, that is close to you. This is, I live in Utah, and so this is a, a screenshot from the web page that shows the chapters here in Utah. And this shows the, the members of my chapter. And um, I have found intelligent, um, generous, caring friends um, as a result of joining the Daughters of the American Revolution. So this is the mentor interest form that is on that website. So now we're going to, to talk about the application. Okay, um, This is a sample of a, an application that you can order um, you don't have to prove clear back to your patriot is what you need to do is prove back to someone else that has proved a link to a patriot. And this is the one that I started with. Um, what's important on this is the number, the national number. So each of the daughters of the American Revolution is assigned a number. So there's a number for the daughter, there's a number for the um, Patriot also. So there's the two numbers that you need to to be able to, to that, that you'll use kind of as call numbers to identify these Patriots. Okay, so um, the, the second, there's three pages we're going to talk about. The next page is the lineage page. Okay, and um, the lineage page 
um, is has all these little check marks. If this was in color, you'd be able to see that these are probably red check marks. And what's valuable about that is to understand that every date, every place, everything that is on this lineage has a document attached to that. And um, so often we, we have family histories that they put all of these dates and names and things like that and you say, well, well how can I trust that? And um, so that is one of the things that gives you confidence about the pedigrees that you're going to find in these applications given by these daughters. You know that somebody who has some background in documents and proofs and things like that has sat down and poured over this and said, yes, this is right and this isn't. Now, some of the early ped, uh, applications that were sent in um, weren't as carefully documented as the later. And so currently, the Daughters of the American Revolution are going through. And when they find conflicts and pedigrees in that, they are redlining them. And they're identifying those um, applications that, that the proofs perhaps were not as strong as they should have been or that there is new evidence that's come out that's shown that, that the document didn't pertain to the ancestor that the, that the application was given for. Okay, this is a little bit larger, closer up of this that, that document that I, I showed you. You'll notice that um, there's a, a, um, like a number here, and so that was the number of the Patriot. Up here we have 1850C, and so that probably meant the 1850 census. But these little notes I find are is interesting because they also tell me that someone else has gone over and, and questioned some of the information and, and um, have put um, little pieces of clues. My favorite one on this page is a state. Um, and so that says, oh, okay, there was a probate, there was a state record that was one of the documents that perhaps um, that note was put in by the Daughters of the American Revolution as they looked at this pedigree. So the third page that we're going to look at is um, the Ancestors um, Service page. And the top of the page, it shows what proof they had that he served. Now, the, the patriots, or ancestors as they may be called, don't have to be serving the military. They just have to prove that they were patriots. Um, they could have been widows who donated money to um, or helped to clothe the soldiers or provided food or um, perhaps they provided horses or something like that. And, and so that's all they needed to have some type of documentation that proved that that ancestor, male or female, um, was a patriot of the American Revolution. Um, that's the part. Um, the next page um, is the reference page. Okay. And so um, I'm going to blow up that area that I have in red to, so that you can look at it a little bit closer. These references, um, there were attachments that were sent in with the very first applications. And each of those little checks, again, shows that, that those documents were attached. Um, originally, the daughters allowed um, those documents to be sent back. So you'll see there at the very top, it says marriage license. Well, if you send in your marriage license with an application, of course, you wanted it back. Um, remember, this is 1890, and um, our photocopies, of course, didn't really um, get started until the 1970s, 100 years later. Um, as you're familiar, you could go to um, have an affidavit um, written out that said this is what's on the license and have it signed and notarized and sent in. But, but it, they would send back a lot of those early records so that the people could keep those. So even though um, the early applications were closer in lineage to the Patriots, the later applications 
um, because they kept the documents, you might want to order or um, get a hold of um, a later um, document because those original documents were no longer sent back and the Daughters of the American Revolution has those microfilmed or digitized and on file. So let's go through this. Um, so the first generation, she used a birth certificate and then her father's birth certificates, her mother's birth certificate. Um, and then um, after the birth certificates, of course, no longer existed, then we get into the interesting proofs, the, the histories, the um, genealogical quarterlies, the estate papers, um, um, and abstracts of a pension file. And um, those wonderful documents, look at this John Huckabee deed. Um, and so these wonderful documents that will help you to, to strengthen and to expand your pedigree. Um, now the second part of this page, um, the reference for lineage page, is called the, the children. Um, the newer applications um, may not have this filled out, but the early ones, earlier ones do, okay? Um, because now they're requiring that you have documentation for every single child that you wrote down there. Um, earlier, these weren't as well proven, but this page was extremely valuable to me. The, the daughter, Celia, that is here, who is married to Fleet Fallon, was the one that I wanted to prove my lineage through. Um, I was trying to do a daughter to daughter to daughter till I got to my patriot and, and I was successful, but no one had ever proved a lineage through the daughter, this daughter Celia. And that will be true. You will find that even though there are a lot of children that came through a patriot, not all of these children may have um, daughters who applied um, to the Daughters of the American Revolution to become members. Um, and so this page here, um, as you're looking at this, you say, okay, there was a son John, and there's a son James, and then it just says daughter, and then it says Mason. And so this was, remember, back with those estate um, records that the, the husband was the person who would receive the land um, for the daughter, and so only his name would be named in an estate paper. And so by having this list, I was able to find um, those the fan club, the friends, the associates, the neighbors that helped me to be able to find documents that helped me to prove this lineage. So this was a very valuable part of the page, uh, the application for me. Okay, so next I, I would like to talk to you about using the records and the collections of the Daughters of the American Revolution. As these daughters were proving these pedigrees and when they had the chapters, they started to create a library, a collection. They said, you know what, we need to build a library. And there's kind of an inside joke that um, the sons were the first to be organized, but the daughters um, um, in 1910 got this beautiful library in DC, but it took the sons another hundred years to get their money together to get their library. And um, this library is very famous. It is one of the top three genealogical research libraries in um, the United States. Um, it is really valuable because um, the research that these daughters have done, I know up at the Family History Library, when I would go in and I would pull a book off the shelf, I would open it up and it would say, contributed by the Daughters of the American Revolution. And I'd pull out the next book and it'd say, this uh, was this chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution did these cemetery records or, or created these indexes and that. And so a huge part of the collection in Salt Lake really was dependent upon these chapters that, that um, created these collections. 
Um, there are over half a million manuscripts, um, collections, and resources. And it is a huge research library. They have over 20,000 visitors. Uh, and they're not necessarily women or daughters. It can be, it's open to many visitors. Um, it was started through donations um, that came from these chapters. And um, they started scouring the cemeteries and doing inventories. And they started a healthy competition to donate the most books to the library. And they start out with a little hall. And then it grew and it grew until it filled their auditorium. And, um, and that in, um, right now, they have 25,000 compiled family histories that have been uh, com contributed there. Um, to the library. And then they have a lot of digitized records. They have a lot of original manuscripts that have been contributed to the Daughters of the American Revolution Library. So I mentioned how these chapters, they created what they're called the, the GRC reports. Um, that's their little abbreviation. Um, and it, it stands for Genealogical Records Committee. Um, and the, um, the, they um, started organizing themselves. So they say, OK, we're going to go in our little county, and we're going to do a census of every single cemetery in our county. And then they would publish these books. Um, they would say, OK, now we're going to go through, and we're going to transcribe all of the Bible records of all of the early pioneers in this state. And so, so then they would transcribe Bible records. And then they would go through and they would transcribe the early marriage records. And so these commi this committee, the, the preservation of the records, the indexes that they have created are, are really very, very valuable to us um, now. Um, when you see these books, sometimes people, they'll open up the book and they'll say, but these aren't original documents. And um, so, of course, you, we know what that means. Um, there could be mistakes um, in the transcriptions or in the collection. In fact, I have to laugh. I have a, um, an early grandfather in Georgia. And when they transcribed it, they accidentally put the grandmother's birth and death date as the same as the grandfather's. And so then when I go and I see, um, for example, on find a grave, the, the wrong date from the headstone on find a grave, I say, oh, they didn't do their own research. They, they just used the, the Daughters of the American Revolution's um, publication for their, their typescript. Um, but always be aware that, that these GAR, GRC reports um, are um, transcriptions. Um, and then there are um, originals also that they have collected. Um, this is a current project um, that is um, the Lawrence County. They have gone through and have um, all the DAR cemetery records. And, and these books are available through their little local library. Um, as you start to do genealogical research, you're going to run into these all over, these projects that the daughters have done from these, um, these um, GRC reports. Now we're going to move on. We're going on to um, the DAR.org. And when I get there, we've already been here when it, you know, talks about, you know, the research services and, and all of that. But, but the most valuable place to do research is the GR, GRS, okay? And, and you'll just click on that, and, um, and it's going to take you to this next page. And this is the page that um, is the most valuable for research because it links to their databases. Um, and so here at the top, you'll see this little ribbon that has ancestor, member, descendants, GRC, Bible records, resources. And so that's what we're going to spend the next part of our time talking about. There is a, a good little um, tutorial here that you can watch. Um, as if you scroll down, you'll be able to, to read a, a, an in-depth in description of each of these databases. Um, Okay, so the first one we're going to talk about 
is the ancestor. Um, there are some pub published books published by the daughters that they say the Patriots Index, uh, but now the, the daughters call it the Ancestor Index. And these are the ancestors that have proven lineages up to them. Now you say, well, is everybody that served in the military in this index? No. If you died and you didn't have any children, especially if you didn't have any daughters, then, then you will not be in this index. Okay. Um, so these are proven lineages in the ancestor. When you start to type um, in here, this is um, has a lot of things to fill in. Um, um, if you have a very common name, you may need to use this to, to simplify. But just like any database, you want to start large. Um, my ancestor's name is um, Philip Huckabee. And I think I've documented about six different ways you can spell Huckabee. And um, so in their index, they have identified one version of Huckabee. So you need to figure out all the different ways you could spell Huckabee and Philip. I think I found about three or four different ways to spell Philip. But I just put in Huckabee. And then if that one didn't work, then I, I try the next spelling. Until and then um, we're going to go ahead and then click on the search. Okay. Um, so then it's going to come up. Um, um, here is Philip's information. And you, you can recognize this information from that um, application that I showed you. Uh, Philip served in North Carolina. He was um, a, what they call a non commissioned officer. I didn't realize that um, he was a piper, um, played his little pipe, um, but they considered him non-commissioned officers because they were right next to the officers and in battle they would have to play the little tune that would tell people to charge, to retreat, to move to the right, to move to the left. And, and so um, even though I just think of him as a little boy and standing next with his pipe, he actually was a non-commissioned officer. And then it says a birth date and has his, um, the county that he reported that he was born in and his death date. And um, then it has his pension number and it has his service source. So these were the numbers that I was talking to you about that, that, that identify your ancestor. And then there's an ancestor number that is up here. And so anyone that proves a lineage to this Philip Huckabee, doesn't matter how they spell Huckabee, um, this is his ancestor. Um, then down below, um, it has the spouse or spouses that he has. And then um, if you scroll down a little bit further, then, then you're going to see um, this. These are um, applications that have been proven for Philip. Um, as you remember, when I showed you the children, there was John. And John is a very carefully proven pedigree because John happens to have a deed that said um, where he bought land from his father, Philip. And that was an easy proof. But my ancestor, Celia, wasn't an easy proof. I had to gather a lot of uh, documents to bring it all together and prove it. And so I was the very first one who proved Celia Huckabee. And then when I went in to do this, this webinar, I, I pulled up the screenshot and I looked and there, there are two more Celia Huckabee um, um, in there. And I thought, well, gee, did they use my documentation to prove their lineage? Or um, because I've only been a member for about a year. And so that is one of the reasons to go ahead and join and to put your lineage in there is so that other people will be able to, to use your documents and to use your proofs to, to be able to um, go through this. And, and um, so, um, okay, on these screens, you've probably seen this little icon that, that means um, um, pedigrees. Um, and so those are, um, we'll click on that in a minute, but you'll also notice name restricted. And so um, as you're looking at this, you're saying, well, Marilyn, your name isn't next to your pedigree um, when we clicked on that. And, and that's something 
in my classes, people will come in and they'll say, well, I can't find my aunt's name in their database. Um, and when Because when we clicked on that little icon, uh, the pedigree icon, it went over to the descendants database. Well, there's the rights of privacy. And so if you had an aunt or a grandmother that was a daughter of the, um, then you'll go ahead and have to email or write to the national and say, you know, can you tell me what her number was and help me to get her application so I can go ahead and join. Um, but the, if your um, grandmother can give her number, then you would even be able to, to pull up her pedigree and then go ahead and send your application in based on, on that pedigree. Okay, we're going to go ahead and click on that little icon and it's going to go back to this page, um, the descendants list. And you probably recognize this information from that application that we, we looked over. Um, these have all of those little dates. That, but darn it, the check marks are missing. And I kind of, kind of said, oh, wait. I, but you, you do have the confidence that, that there is a document somewhere for each of the pieces of information that is on this page. Okay, um, next um, you probably, you're saying, okay, I get this, I get that. Um, um, one of the things that is up here is um, purchase this record copy. Um, and so if you wanted to purchase this, then um, you could click on there. Okay, I'm trying to remember. Okay, there it goes over to... Um, this is back to that um, page with Celia. Um, over here on the side, um, you could um, click on, um, let's see, just a minute, I'm trying to think of what screenshots I have. Okay, here is where I clicked on Celia, and it um, then goes, um, um, Oh, the, it, that, that is my application. And so um, this little message comes up and it says, um, Marilyn's um, documentation hasn't finished with the digitization and the uploading and the processing and that. But, but you can go ahead and you can write and you can um, get a copy of that applications that have been coming, but it's not necessarily available online, that information. Okay, so then over here is the purchase, how to purchase the applications, okay? And you click on one of those and you'll see um, this come up. It says purchase the associated record. And um, the, um, when you purchase a copy of the application, it's $10 each. Um, if you want those documents, um, then it's $20 each. And um, is what happens is they send you a link and it's digital. And so you can sit there in your pajamas and you can, if it has been longer than a year and if it's in their system, you can go ahead and purchase, see those um, for a whole week. You have an opportunity to download the digital copies of, of that. So $10 for an application and then $20 for the supporting documents that were included. Now, the documents that pertain to, to living people um, may not um, be sent you, but, but um, you can be able to tie into these ancestors by purchasing um, those documents. Okay. All right. So then it's going to come over here. Um, you can see this. It says download um, a PDF and for $10. You have the application. This is the supporting documentation. And then you can just click once to get both of them at the same time. Okay, so now we're going to um, um, go over to um, um, this one. It says um, this, the, this is um, DAR um, copyrighted, basically. And it says that you can't put these documents into a published history or you can't scan them and put them online for other people and say, hey, I've got it free here. You don't have to pay money for this. Um, uh, there is a copyright law that is attached to those documents. Okay. All right. Um, so as we 
talk about this, there's some terms that we have used that um, we said there's the ancestor database. The term documentation refers to those supporting documents, those birth certificates, death certificates, and things like that. I, I mentioned earlier, older applications probably don't have documents because before the, the photocopy machines. And basically, that was about 1960 when those photocopies became available. And I remember how expensive and how um, poor those early copies were. But after 1984, um, it is required that photocopies were sent in. And so when you're looking for an application to buy, uh, pick one that will be a little bit later um, that's more in the seven. Um, thousand numbers rather than that early early numbers of those early members okay there's also uh, what's called a supplemental application so for example I have about six other revolutionary war ancestors that that I researched and I want to prove their lines and so those will be supplemental and um, the daughters when they have a proven line they'll, they'll get a little pin that has their patriot's name on and then as they prove other ancestors then they'll also get a, um, a little pin that they'll wear for these supplemental lineages that, that she has. Okay. Um, some of the early ones the, the DAR doesn't um, have a guarantee that they meet today's genealogical standards. Um, so for example, um, one of the early applications that I saw was um, just a photograph of an index and that now we're getting a little bit more um, so that we require better standards and, and we want original documents or, um, and that then those, those early applications. Um, but those early, early patriots that were closer um, in lineage to their ancestors and that were, were probably still correct. And so unless there's a document that's come out and says, no, no, this person is, you, you, somebody else is, is the person that they're using the military pension for, um, unless there is someone who's brought a question in, those applications are still acceptable. Okay, so this, when you go into the database, um, what we're looking at is um, this is um, a person who um, there wasn't enough documentation perhaps with that early application and so um, they may want you to prove um, put a little more evidence into the proof on that and so there's a little question there. Um, this Ross Alexander, as you can see, there's three Ross Alexanders and um, I happen, this is one of the lines I'm trying to prove um, and you see this one's from Scotland. Well, people have perhaps borrowed um, his Revolutionary War pension um, and but he wasn't you know, perhaps the right one. And so that pension may have been somebody had used the wrong pension for the wrong person. So they're, they're not saying, okay, that he didn't serve in the military, but they're saying you, you, you need to do a little more research to prove that your Alexander is the Alexander tied to the, 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 the pension. Okay, so this is the little, when you click on that, this is the little pop-up that'll come up and say um, it's, it's no longer valid. There's subsequent evidence of proof of service may have determined the proof wasn't acceptable under today's standards. Okay, another little red pop-up that may um, pop up is treat as a new ancestor. And again, the pop-up says um, uh, that there wasn't, um, there was no application or supplemental application that was verified since those very early days with those granddaughters of the Patriot, and so they they want this to be re-verified. Okay, all right. Um, now we're going to go up to. Um, I wanted to just mention to you up here at the top, we we have been flipping between these three databases. 
because they're all tied to the applications, okay? And so um, as we click on one icon, it'll move to the membership. And then as we click on another icon, it went down into the descendants at a database. And so up here, you can see this is the icon. And if you click on that icon, then it's going to move us over into the descendant database, okay? Um, and then if you click on this um, that icon, then it will move into um, the descendants um, application where that person was named. So every single person on these applications is in this descendants thing. So let's say you're just trying to do research not necessarily on a revelationary war, but you're trying to research a descendants. Um, and so that's why this database is so valuable is because you can go in and you can find these descendants and you can find perhaps a Bible record, uh, perhaps a, a probate, perhaps a deed that you didn't even know existed that is part of the documentation that was included as part of the proof of these applications. Okay, there's another little button here that we haven't talked about. It's called search. It's what this hat does is this um, in this descendants, it says, um, I, I want to search all of the Hyatts um, to see what they have. Now, that's not just going to search the first three databases, but it's also going to go in to the Genealogical Record Committee submissions. So it's going to search the cemetery records. It's going to search all of the names in and tax records that have been submitted by these daughters. And so... Um, so that's what that's doing is it's just helping you to be able to, to um, quickly fill in the, the type in that little thing. Okay, we're going to go down um, at the bottom of this page. Um, it says this is the one that said treat as a new ancestor. And so those little um, red lines, they're called, it will pop up and you'll be able to have confidence. If that red line's not there, then that's a proven lineage, okay? Um, and even when you go to prove, you know, to buy a record copy, again, it'll say, oh, there's problems here. And um, so it should be able to give you confidence that, that um, the, the documents that, that are there are verified. And then you can look in to see why and why not. Okay, we're going to move over to the next database. We're going to skip the, the Genealogical Records Committee um, because that's a big topic. And I want to talk about Bibles first, okay? So these daughters um, spend a lot of time collecting Bible records um, and since transcribing Bible records. Um, and of course, transcriptions, as we know with Bible records, um, you don't you aren't able to analyze the handwriting and, and perhaps the history of the Bible or passing the Bible back and forth. And so sometimes that may not help or it may help. Um, but these Bibles, if you can imagine having an every name index to Bibles of uh, pioneers in your area, think how valuable that would be. And so the Daughters of the American Revolution have one of the largest um, Bible collections. Um, and you um, need to be using this little database for Bibles. So I've typed in the name Busby, okay, and um, this is what comes up. Um, this is um, all the Busbys um, that have been named in different Bibles. Um, and then it has a page a little um, number there, and I've put a little arrow by that. We're going to click on that um, little number there. And it's what it's going to take me to is it's going to take me to all of the people in this one Bible or named on this page, okay, on this type transcript. And by looking over the names on there, I can say, oh, th this isn't my Busby, this, yeah, no, no, uh, uh, uh. Um, or else um, I may look at those names and say, oh my goodness, this, this is a Bible record that I need. And so then I, I want a copy of this. I, I need to find this. And, and so then I would be able to, to go into the library and to be able to order copies of it. Okay. All right. So this is a, a little bit bigger picture of that same page. Okay. So um, at, the, at the DAR library, if we were to travel back to Washington and, 
and do some original research there in the library, um, this database links to digital copies of things such as that Bible record. Um, and so you would be able to go in there and you'd be able to click on that available format and be able to print it out there right at, right at your computer. But since you're probably doing this in your pajamas at home, um, you're going to need to order a copy. And um, I'm going to show you later on how to be able to order those copies if you're interested. One of the important things um, you need to also recognize is that the, the generosity of these chapters and these daughters, that they didn't just send the copies of these histories to the National Library, but they also put them in their local historical society, their local genealogical societies, and, and they wanted everybody to be able to see the great work that they did. So as a result, you're going to be able to go in and find these books in other places. So once I have used the DAR index, then I will go in and I will go to say, let's say, Ancestry.com. And um, I will um, look and see, um, this is um, the historical collections of the Georgia chapters of the Daughters of the America Revolution. And um, those CAR records are there. And this is the Bible records that were transcribed in Georgia. And so, um, as you can see, um, this is what a transcript would look like in one of those books, that they, the typescripts that they had sent in, and the information that the Bible would have had. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the, the Genealogical Record Committee reports. Okay, this, is, this database um, is huge and, um, and, and very valuable and growing. Um, they receive about 30 volumes. Um, I can't remember if that was a month or, uh, or 300 volumes, it said, a year that they're putting in. So these are continuing to grow. So um, you need to, to um, recognize that because you searched it today doesn't mean that there won't be more information in it tomorrow. Um, I know even myself, I, I go in and I teach a class and I do a search and then in the middle of the class something else pops up and I go, oh, 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 oh that wasn't there, that wasn't there. And so um, rec realize that, that this is a growing collection. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and, and type in um, Huckabee and um, this is what's going to come up. Okay, so um, there's a lot of Huckabees in Georgia, a lot of Huckabees in Mississippi, uh, Missouri, um, minor in Georgia. Um, and so um, in this report, it, it says, okay, this, there's a Huckabee in the, the tax collection in 1795. And then over here, and if I click on the library catalog, then I would be able to, to get a little bit more information. Um, this is a Celia Huckabee. She has a Georgia marriage. Um, and, then, um, and so then if you go ahead and you click on that little um, number that is up at the top, again, you'll be able to see all of the names that are on that page. So for a Georgia marriage, you're saying, oh, Celia married Fleet Fallon. This will be their marriage record. OK. And then it comes up, and I look, and I say, oh, this Celia doesn't have a, a it, um, there's no one there by the name of Fleet Fallon. So this is a different Celia Huckleby. Um, of course, maybe it's on the next page. I don't know. Maybe this is, an, uh, you know, um, but anyway, that just helps you to know if, if you want to order that or if you don't want to order that. Um, but it gives you a clue. It also gives you a clue that there is a book that may be in one of your local archives that would have that marriage record in it. Um, and perhaps it's been put into a, um, a database there, okay? This next one is a tax record, and you're saying, oh, a tax record, 1795? The Huckabees had tax records? <gasps> I haven't done tax records, and this is just the period that I'm looking. Um, and so then you're going to go ahead and check. And so again, I went on to Ancestry.com to see if, if there was an original. 
um, I went into their card catalog and typed in um, up here I typed in Georgia I typed in tax and sure enough look at this they have um, tax digest guess what these are uh, the genealogical record committee report that has been put into a book and um, ancestry.com has um, take and and has digitized that and there it is um, there is the Huckabee that is in that tax record um, but then then you need to go into FamilySearch.com and, and you need to find the film and you need to look at the original tax records and you need to find all of the information that you can find and glean that from that to be able to, to do some wonderful research. Okay, so here we are. We're in the FamilySearch.org catalog and, and we're going to look not just for um, that tax index because we now know that he's in there, but we want to go um, this this original card shows that the Daughters of the American Revolution created the index. Instead, we want to go over to the, um, the original collection and find those original tax records. Um, and it could be that um, um, you can go in and there's a, a digitized version there that's in their historical record collections. Okay, also on FamilySearch.org is their Family Search books. And this is an example of how those genealogical record committee reports have been digitized. And you can just search for that. Okay. Um, you can see here how this says um, um, Kentucky Society Daughters of the American Revolution. Um, and so this is a Kentucky Cemetery Records Volume 3. Um, right there, right there in your pajamas. You can go ahead and bring that up and, and find um, Old Wash Graveyard. Um, um, the value of these um, books is that many of these headstones, many of these records don't exist anymore. Um, this is my story. This is Celia Huckabee. And I went to um, find her, her grave. And um, I went in and I found her daughter, Melissa Fallon Cosby's headstone. And the Daughters of the American Revolution had done an inventory on this cemetery back, um, I think it was probably 75 years ago. But when I got there, I believe this is her grave. Um, you know, all, everything was washed away. There was no evidence that this was her grave. And so um, that's why... Um, sometimes um, when you go to find a grave and you say, oh, you know, um, she's not there, she's not there. Um, you know what? Um, those daughters preserve those records for us. And um, a lot of that information is being lost. And so we really are indebted to, to what they gave us. Um, only the index um, showed us that she is buried in this little cemetery in Georgia. Okay, um, as these books um, were created in the Daughters of the American Revolution Library and, um, and they were sent to uh, um, the genealogical um, in archives, um, national archives and things like that, the, um, the books were microfilmed by the, the Utah State uh, Utah Genealogical Society and as a result of that these books have been distributed to the family history centers throughout the world um, and we are so grateful for that um, but there are also some indexes that people took those films um, I, um, Kay Kirkham sat down and he created an index to 35,000 microfilms um, of these books um, and um, this is an, an important index for you to know about um, and even more fun is that um, his index is digitized and in, in your pajamas you can go into familysearch.org and um, you can type in um, the name of this index and pull it up and you can use it and so I'm going to teach you how to use this index um, 
There's a handout that goes along with this webinar, and the name of this index is in there. So when you bring it up, because he's trying to compress as much information as possible into as little space as possible, he has a lot of abbreviations. And so when you bring up this digital book, um, you don't want to just flip through the alphabetical thing and come to your family name. You start at the very first and you look at abbreviations used in the index, an example of decoding. And so this is probably one of the most important pages of this index. So let me show you for an example. Okay, um, if you go in here, FR. FR is an abbreviation of a family record of several pages. Okay, FH is a family history. Uh, a C all by itself is a cemetery. Um, SCA is Leonardo Angel um, Andrea's collection of South Carolina, okay. These NJ, uh, New Jersey, um, CA would be California, and so that tells you the state that this is in. Now, as we're talking about these states, uh, you have to remember that um, the in California, the daughter of the American Revolution or the person who has submitted this history, their family came from the East. So um, you're looking for the records of the East in the West. Okay, so, so don't just discount this because it says California. Okay, um, that history may have been compiled in California, but it may be about um, their family back East. Okay, the next little number is these 844. Um, that is the film number at the Family History Library. And then number 16 will be the item on that film. So there may be, um, a, well, we know at least there's 16 volumes on this microfilm, and you're going to hurry and get through that. These microfilms are at BYU. Um, they are at the Family History Library in Salt Lake, and they can be ordered into every Family History Center. Um, a lot of them are in um, the larger collections, uh, larger family history centers will go ahead and have a lot of these um, in their collections. Okay, this is um, when I went to the library catalog on FamilySearch.org. Um, right here you can see this is the digitized version of the index by Kay Kirkham. Um, okay. And you're saying, so one of the questions you have, so um, why when the Daughters of the American Revolution have an all-name index, um, why do I need this index also? And, and as I've thought about that, I thought that um, perhaps the biggest difference is that the, the, the numbering system has changed of those volumes. Um, the Daughters of the American Revolution have created a card catalog to their library collection. And this index has created a card catalog to uh, volumes that were microfilmed. And so it's kind of an accessibility um, thing. Um, if you have access to those microfilms, um, that might be the way you want to go. Or um, if, it's, um, if you found it and you want to be able to order a copy um, online from the Daughters of the American Revolution, um, you know, it's your choice um, of how you use the indexes. But, but that's the, the value of using the different ones. This one is a second collection that Kay Kirkham did because of the success of, of that first uh, filming. Um, an index to the Bibles and family records of the United States. And this is his volume. And, and it works the same way. He has the film number and the item numbers to those Bible records. Um, and um, again, there's the database of the Daughters of the American Revolution to their Bible records. Um, so I find that one more valuable than the, um, the other collection. There are some other indexes um, that have been created by the state daughters of the American Revolution. This is um, one. Um, it's a microfiche um, that is available. 
um, at, at, at BYU, and a lot of family history centers have this microfiche collection. As you can see, again, it has the microfilm number that would take you right to the cemetery transcript or the Bible transcript. And um, just by looking over this, sometimes I'll say, oh, wow, look, um, it says that, that there's a pension record for this John M. Ross. Oh, then I will go ahead and just start looking for the pension correct collection. Um, and so that's another transcript. OK. Um, to be able to find the, this in this microfiche collection, again, you go to the card catalog at the family search, and you find um, the fish that would have your family name that you're looking for. And then when you get to that fish, then you would be able to find the microfilm where that would be. Um, Ancestry.com has some early lineage books. Um, this is just a sample of that. Um, they have um, some Bible records. Family Search has um, books online um, that are, are valuable that are by the daughters. So now we're getting towards the conclusion, and um, I just wanted to be able to tell you about the library search services that the daughters have. Um, when I went to research Celia Huckabee, I thought, well, I would like to see what other uh, people have submitted on Celia. Do, you, do the daughters have any information that other people who have tried to prove a, a lineage through Celia? And so um, I use their, what they call a search service. Um, and this is under the, the library tab. It's, um, remember, we went to the GRS tab, but this is back on the, the first page under the library tab. And um, they have a service, and, and they um, charge by the hour. And then they wrote a report. Um, and uh, I think it cost me. $35, and then I had this beautiful report that had lists of documents that people had submitted, um, anything that they had, and, and um, that was worth my time to be able to do that. Um, other search things that they have is they have a, a photocopy f um, for a $10 fee, covers 10 photocopies. They have documentation requests that we've already talked about. But this is the page that you go to. Um, down here they have a um, a research request form um, or um, a search request, and and um, you can send that in. Um, when I did mine, you had to do a hard copy. I think they've now got it digitized, I'm, I think. Um, but you send it in, and then they will send you a bill, and, and you'll be able to get those copies. So now it's time for us to come to our conclusion. Um, and one of the things that, um, when I was thinking about do joining the Daughters of the American Revolution, um, I you know, had people saying, oh, you know, they've helped me so much. I, I found a little thing on a headstone, and it just opened up you know, my thing. And so I heard good stories. But um, in literature and movies and that, you, you get this picture of the Daughters of the American Revolution as kind of hoity-toities, you know. Um, these are people that are sticking their nose up at other people because they're a lineage society, and they say, oh, you can't belong to our society. We are the Daughters of the American Revolution. We, you know, um, and that. And so I had to, to take a step back and, and think about that and, and um, as I have evaluated this, I thought, you know what? Uh, my experience has been um, these are hardworking women who have really contributed many great things and have created patriotism and service and have, um, and so that, that was valuable to me. And so that's what I gained from it. And so I've, I've kind of thought, of, as I thought about that, I've thought they wanted to, to honor their patriots who um, fought to establish America. And they put their lives on the line. And, um, and as they, um, so first of all, those small people, those patriots did great things. Look at this great nation they established. And then the Daughters of the American Revolution have worked hard, and they have established a great thing. And now there's your research. 
there's the heritage that you are going to pass down to the people that come behind you. And you have a choice. Um, you know, um, the stories that you find, um, are you going to just you know, keep those quite close to your chest? Or are you going to write them down? Are you going to put them on FamilySearch.org? Um, you know, write those stories down, and or are you going to put them in a little book and send them to your grandchildren and, and say, you know, we need to be proud. I know as I have researched these ancestors, I gather my little grandkids around and I tell them the stories of the battles. I tell them the exciting things that happen, and their eyes get all shiny and exciting, and and um. And that's what this is really about, is, is um, many small people in many small places do many small things. And that can alter the face of the world. And so I want you to think about how you, what legacy you're leaving and how you're altering the world and leaving it a better place. And with that in conclusion, I, I, I wish you good luck. Okay, um, Brandon, do we have some questions? Um, thank you very much. It looks like we don't have any questions for today, at least not at the moment. If you have questions, please write in in the chat box, and we'd love to answer those for you. Um, we'd like to remind everybody that this webinar, as well as all of our others, are being recorded and posted online on our BYU Family History Library website, and um, as well as on our YouTube channel. Today's handout is uh, will be available later on as, at our website um, below. Um, down here, if you go to this website, you'll be able to see all of the past recordings and be able to download our handout as well um, for this webinar and all of the other webinars. Um, we encourage you to look at our schedule um, for upcoming webinars so you can join us next time. We thank you very much for joining us today.